All right. Well, thank you for joining uh, us this morning, this afternoon. And uh, this is our quarterly uh, public safety update. Uh, I think uh, we've done enough of these now that you know uh, what to expect. You'll, you'll see some uh, data on, on, uh, on homicides and gun violence. You'll also see data on our, our community engagement side, uh, our recruitment side, and, and just our top focus areas. Uh, I'll start off the top saying that there won't be any uh, breaking news uh, out of this uh, this quarterly update, but we will see and, and be able to show some progress in, in a lot of the areas of things we've talked about uh, over the past year or two. And so that includes uh, both uh, our recruitment efforts, uh, getting back up to full staffing levels. You know, we said we we're going to get there, and and uh, by and here we are, and and. Uh, we're there, and uh, in terms of our, our crime, real-time crime center, uh, it's up and running, fully up and running, and, and the, the community is starting to come on board and, and integrate uh, their systems into our system. So, uh, I'll, with that, I'll, I'll we'll get started and get to the get to the pieces. Yeah, and, and like I said, there will be a. There's a couple of slides here on on the uh, announcement we made earlier this week about community policing uh, engagement effort. And so this uh, is one of the last remaining pieces of our 21 CP recommendations, if, if you recall that, uh, started about three years ago uh, on that process, working through different things. So as all the other pieces have moved forward, this is, this is one of the last uh, remaining items uh, that we're working on. And so we want to hear from residents and, and make sure uh, they fill out the survey and, and uh, leave their feedback. And, and there will also be uh, other feedback opportunities uh, in person uh, and others coming up, but we do want to get started and, and hear from them uh, as soon as possible. So we did appreciate the the uh, announcement that, that you guys made when we sent that out earlier this week, but want to continue to make sure that uh, we get folks involved uh, because that's what it's going to take. Uh, our officers can do what they can do, but to, to make this a safe community for everyone, uh, we need the whole community to come on board. And, and just to echo some of the things that the mayor said, what, I just want to be uh, begging you, if you will, please help us with that community survey to push that out. We've already done it internally. We started that last week. Uh, ours will end, I think, uh, the beginning of next week, meaning from the police department. So the officers have their own survey to fill out. Uh, we will compare what the officers have said or what they think or what they think should ha be happening. And then we'll compare that when we compile all the information from the community. So we have been looking at what is the middle ground? Where do we start? What is our foundation, et cetera? That's exactly what we're looking for. We've never done this before, I don't think in the history of the city, to find out, we, you know, maybe we have, may have done them at CAG meetings or something like that, but that's a lot smaller. We, now the whole city has an opportunity to have input on what they think or believe that our community relationship with the police department should be and vice versa. So I uh, just wanted to underscore that. <clears throat> I can touch on this next slide to piggyback off of community engagement. There are a couple of community outreach events that South Bend Police Department has taken part in uh, in, recent, in recent weeks, and then there are a couple coming up in the coming weeks. Touching on quickly our Stock Up for Summer Food Drive, thank you to all of you that helped us publicize that. We had a month-long donation drive where we had donation boxes here at the PD and then at the Goodwill Career Center on Western. Uh, we received a, a ton of different donations between that month-long period and our actual physical drive this past Saturday here at the South Bend Police Department. That was a partnership with Save Outreach, who we rely on heavily to be able to do what we're able to do in our community. So with the results of that food drive, our food pantry is now fully stocked and we're also able to share some things with other local organizations that assist residents in that way. So we received a lot of food, diapers, wipes, uh, baby products, you name it. So we're gonna be able to bag those up into essentially go bags for our officers so they can keep that with them so they can quickly uh, grab a bag and help a family in need. So we thank our community for doing that. Uh, looking forward, we are planning with our strategic focus unit a couple back to school and uh, schools out cookouts at some local parks here in town. Uh, the first one coming up on Saturday, June 3rd, if that date sounds familiar, that's going to be Sunburg Saturday. That's going to be after all that. That's going to be at Kennedy Park. And then we have another one right before school starts back up uh, at Southeast Park. So again, that's going to be with our strategic focus unit. They're going to be grilling up some food, having some fun stuff there. Crime Stoppers will be there. Uh, other community organizations will be there. Just a way for us to, to reach um, 
different parts of our community in a different way, in a fun way. And then we'll uh, pivot over now to our recruitment and hiring process. I'll be covering the next few slides, and as Ashley just said, recruitment and hiring process. So. And as an announcement, we pushed out about a month and a half ago that we would be continuing our prospect days. Hold your thought. Hold on, yeah. Sure. Yes. We playing poker here? Or what is, we're all in. <laughs> as you can see behind me, June 24th will be our next, next prospect days. It's our fifth. We did four of these last year. Huge benefit in get us, getting us back to the, to the staffing levels we need to be at. And so... As a reminder, it's an expedited process in which five out of eight steps to be hired at the police department are all done in one day. In the past, individuals who wanted to be hired had to come back here several times, which involves if for them, many of them taking off work if they're from out of state, um, taking off more than one day sometimes. And so to get this all, most of it done in one day, five out of eight steps has been a huge benefit to us. And you'll see on the next slide some of those results. I talked about um, in our last uh, meeting, which was the beginning of February, we gave updates on the last quarter of 2022, and we advised you all that we would be swearing in 17 new officers who are graduating from our police academy in mid-February. So that, that did happen, and we have 17 new officers that are out in field training now, so they're riding with officers who are certified and giving them instructions so that they can eventually be on their own and assigned to a patrol shift. And that's going very well. We expect to have all of them done and completed by July. So from a numbers perspective, you see that we're at 243 officers right now, which matches that peak that we were at in 2019. Looking back at the last five years, that was the highest staffing number we had, and we're currently at that now. But again, Several of those officers are in training, so they won't be on their own and um, operating in the patrol division until that training is complete. So we've closed the gap through our training division and help from everyone on the police department, from our PIO to officers recruiting out there themselves, patrol officers knowing individuals that are interested in, and encouraging them to come out and participate in prospect days. And as always, a priority for us is to become a diverse police department and match the national um, averages and exceed the national averages and that will continue to be a priority for us last year every quarter we saw an increase in the percentages that you see before you this month we are reporting the same percentages and a slight decrease with the hispanic percentage and so we're going to continue to do what we have been doing with prospect days and getting those individuals through the process and helping them with whatever they need in order to become a more diverse police department. Do we need to shuffle them back over? Can you get you guys? Oh, yeah, we can. We're waiting on the shuffle. Yeah. Maybe we should move these. You, hey, you want to rotate? <laughs> All right, just a little data review. Um, obviously, this is what we do typically every quarter um, to give you perspectives, um, maybe quell some rumors. Um, does it make anybody feel better? Absolutely not. If these numbers were zero, zero we wouldn't be having these, uh, and it would make us certainly all feel better. Uh, but notably, doing the comparisons, um, the same time frames up until April 30th of, of last year, we had 255 uh, shooting incidents. Out of those inc uh, incidents, um, 34 people were shot, criminally shot. If you look this year, we've had 259 incidents in that same time frame. So four more incidents, but we've only had 24 people shot out of those incidents. So more incidents, less people, doesn't matter, it's above zero. Um, we recovered 137 uh, guns in that same time frame from last year comparison, and then um, 205 this year. I think I just got an uh, updated number uh, for now, it was just, just over 230, I think it was 231 that uh, our strategic focus just sent me this morning. We, I happened to stop in at the conference and, and talk to them, but we are still going to the end of April. Um, that way we remain consistent. Uh, the next slide is, well, I mean, you can read it yourself. This is exactly the same slide. It's a screenshot of what we have on our transparency hub. 
And I'll just use this as another friendly courtesy reminder to please visit our transparency hub. It's all there. Most of the questions that you're probably going to ask, have asked, or maybe haven't thought about asking yet are probably going to be answered on that transparency hub. I know our IT, Ashley, and others, including our internal affairs, keeps that constantly updated. Um, but again, to remain consistent, we, we use the numbers that uh, at the end of the month, those will be compiled within the next day or two uh, to remain consistent with that closing of that prior month. Um, so those are all up to date. I, you can look on here and I, I mean, read those for yourself. You all should have a packet to read. And if you have questions about those afterwards, we will certainly um, answer those. So as you can see on the screen, we're going to touch base on the... Switching. We're just going to switch seats. <laughs> All right. The uh, death investigations. And so as you can see, this is going to be October, 20, October 2021 through the end of April um, for 2023. The total number is going to be 50 death investigations. Of those 50, the breakdown is 12 suspicious deaths with there being zero open cases under that, and a total of 38 homicide investigations. Of those 38 homicide investigations, there are currently eight open investigations. One thing that we wanna kinda highlight with this is that some of these investigations can take months. Um, for instance, we do have a 2022 homicide. It occurred last June, and that is a case that we found, we've got charges last month in April. And so it very well could be a, a lengthy investigation. With those open cases, one of the things that the police department has worked to do is look at all avenues of getting information and obtaining new leads. And one way of doing that is with Michiana Crime Stoppers. And so we partnered with Michiana Crime Stoppers and the new program that they, or that we have implemented is a geofence technology for a campaign that was first launched in April with the Alexis Morales case. There's a new campaign in May uh, with Johnny Lee Johnson, who was shot and killed last May. And then in the month of June, it will highlight uh, Deontay Williams' murder. And again, the way that this works is a one mile radius surrounding the homicide scene itself. If you travel around or within that one mile radius, uh, you could get an ad on your uh, smartphone or anything that's using the internet. Um, it's not on social media, so something other than that. Um, and then it's a way for our community to know about that homicide and submit anonymous tips right from that ad. And so that is, again, something that the police department and Crime Stoppers has worked together on to get that out into our community. Back to you. Oh, no. I think it's Chief Skibbons. Oh, I'm up. Oh. Strategies and programs. Uh, first block, two strategies that we cover in, in our public safety update. As far as block goes, this is a reminder behind me of the technology license plate readers that we utilize here in the city and also how we utilize it. And the next slide gives a breakdown of this past quarter. Um, you see at the bottom there that total, that's our successes that we have had in this quarter, and then a breakdown of where those successes are as far as what type of crimes they have helped us to investigate and recover stolen vehicles or pick up wanted parties on warrants. That number at the bottom, 25, is down slightly from the last quarter of 2022, due in large part to a crime spree that we saw with motor vehicle thefts. Um, I think we had roughly 30 to 35 motor vehicle thefts that were um, investigations that LPRs helped us recover those vehicles or at least give us lead information to look into uh, stolen vehicles. That crime spree had to do with Kia model vehicles, makes I should say, and there were several things on social media um, giving individuals information on how to boost those vehicles. So throughout the country uh, we saw Kias being stolen at a very high rate and that did happen here in South Bend in the last quarter. So our overall total is down and that is due uh, in part to that crime spree that we have with motor vehicle thefts the last quarter of 2022. We have extended, before we move to the next slide, our flock usage. Uh, we're currently having flock cameras installed in parking garages downtown. That is set to be complete sometime in May. So 
all three of the parking garages will eventually have LPR cameras in or near the, the parking garages. And then we move on to ShotSpotter Connect. And again, this is what ShotSpotter Connect is. It's a res resource deployment technology that we utilize here in South Bend. And then the how is also listed behind me. As far as updates, I have, we have an actual update that took place with ShotSpotter Connect. We were working on this with them the last quarter of 2022. We saw some areas where we needed to improve our resource deployment. And through their technology, we gave them um, some instances we wanted them to work on inside the technology that, to provide better oversight for our supervisors. That was implemented in January. So because of that, we have seen our percentages go up. Missions completed, you can see, is 96% now. The last quarter of 2022, we were only at 86%. And so that 10% improvement is because of the update. Officers previously were allowed to, two officers could be in a mission zone and they would both get credit for the time spent there. And now only one officer at a time can get credit in that mission zone. So it spreads out our resource deployment to the other missions throughout the city or the beat in which those officers are currently working in. And that is the only update I have for ShotSpotter Connect. Moving on to our real-time crime center. Launched, as the mayor said, to start off the year, the first week of January or the second week of January, we announced that our real-time crime center was up and running with use of FUSIS technology. Shortly thereafter, in February, we launched SyncSouthBend.org, and businesses and residents were able to register their cameras. We have over 600 cameras now registered in the city of South Bend. That's both businesses and residents. So it makes investigations that much more efficient. We can, through Sync South Bend, send direct emails to individuals or business owners if a crime occurred in their area and ask them to review a certain time frame that they may have a video of. And so they can email that evidence back in, or our detectives can also go out and collect it. That it makes us more efficient because in the past, officers would have to go out, canvas an area, look for potential cameras, and then ask if we could review some of that camera footage. And so much more efficient with our investigations due to camera registry. 117 cameras are integrated into our real-time crime center as of right now. In an order for a business or a resident to integrate, they can go to syncsouthbend.org to purchase a FUSIS camera. The cost is roughly 300, it depends on how many cameras a business has, and then a $150 subscription fee per year. That can all be done through syncsouthbend.org. In the upcoming future, we, we anticipate possibly June, the city through um, innovation and technology is working with DCI to come up with ways that the city of South Bend can help those businesses and residents purchase FUSIS, FUSIS cores so we can increase that integrated camera number from 117. Okay. <clears throat> I just want to add a, a couple more things on there. So. So on, on top of what Dan was saying, uh, and I know this is uh, um, near and dear to the, to the mayor as well, some of the things that have been said out there, false information is not, we are not focusing on anyone or anything when it comes to the camera integrations. We know based on analytical proof and evidence, whether it's statements, shell casings, other videos, uh, witnesses, something that we have legitimately documented into our reporting system that bad things are happening at whatever this location. This is how we came about um, asking certain businesses, certain areas uh, for their cameras to be integrated so we would be able to access that if necessary, if an emergency should arrive. We cannot do that, will not do that uh, with home cameras. When a call goes out, 123 Elm Street, dispatch dispatches that call, and we are notified by FUSIS of what cameras are in that area the people have either integrated or that we have a list of four houses, for example, in the 200 block of Elm. That information is sent out to the people, hey, we had something bad happen here between this time frame. Do you have anything? If so, where are you willing to share it between these hours? They can choose yes, they can choose no, they can choose not to respond. Uh, but it's a lot better than the process we, the very slow and methodical and painstaking process we have now. So again, just a brief reiteration, it is not focusing on anyone or anything. 
uh, whatsoever. It's based on when something happens. Also, uh, our real-time crime center and our officers in their laptops could be able to see if those cameras are integrated, if an armed robbery occurs at that, at that 123 Elm Street, they would be able to see those cameras. So another officer responding or somebody in our RTCC can say, hey, red Monte Carlo is going northbound right now. Uh, and it just crossed over whatever intersection it is. So the officer's not looking at their laptops as they're trying to drive in a call where, you know, shots were fired or a robbery just occurred. They're trying to respond to that call. If they're coming the opposite way, they have knowledge of that, not just to catch the suspect, but hopefully to prevent something bad from happening and catch the suspect. So to give just a little recap or update, I'm, I know you are familiar with it, but again, false, false remarks keep getting put out there. Um, and they're simply not true. Before we turn it over to questions, I just want to touch on a couple last community items uh, for events and engagements. I already talked about the police department and GBI community cookouts. Those are going to be this summer. But also, in addition to that, I want to remind you that we do have those monthly community crime stat meetings. Our latest one was actually last night here in this room. Continuing to see great attendance on that, so we appreciate our media partners' help in getting the word out about those and our community and attending those. The last couple have been on an evening where it's been 75, 80 degrees, and we thought, oh, I wonder if anyone will show up, and we, we have a pretty full room. So we appreciate those who, who come and, and share their thoughts and see our crime stats. One last thing is with our Police Athletic League, they are hosting a boxing showcase at the Beacon, which is where they hold their PAL programs. Um, that's going to be on Wednesday, May 24th. You'll see a further press release and invitation about that, but it'll just be a showcase about what PAL is, and you'll see some uh, eight matches that night of, of some boxers, so it should be a good time. And at this point, we'll open it up to questions from anyone in the media. Uh, on the topic of the cameras, I just wanted to make sure I'm understanding. At least when the numbers say 117 integrated cameras, that is those, that number is only businesses or residents who have um, had their cameras integrated, or does that also include city-owned cameras? Not residents. Just, so just yeah. businesses? And, and, and city. And city. Can, I think it's city-owned yes. and business. City and business, yes. So the, the residents will never, unless they, they choose to do it, they have a core and they have an elaborate camera system, but if it's okay. just, yeah. if it's just a, a normal ring camera, that will never be fully integrated uh, within the, the real-time crime center. So if again, if a resident wants to connect, you know, it, but they, you know, very strict things have to happen in residential neighborhoods. These only cameras that are in public rights of way, you know, it gets. So it'll, I would, don't say basically never uh, in a residential sure. neighborhood. There may be a couple of rare exceptions uh, with elaborate uh, security sure. uh, systems uh, for some folks, but uh, otherwise, businesses and city okay. city owned. Gotcha. Yeah. Um, and then I guess on, on that topic. It's obviously been a long process with integrating the real-time crime center and we've uh, talked and asked questions and you guys have said you know what what you hope it will do and uh, areas which you hope it will help with um, still early days but you know a few months into kind of getting the full thing up and running has it done what you have hoped it will do is are there areas where it's been very helpful are there unexpected ways in which it's um, been good or bad or just kind of general comments on the system overall now that you kind of had it up and running for a full few months here. I'm tempted to defer to Kayla on that, but I, I don't want to, they have been helpful in some recent investigations. Uh, I, I know that seems very skirting of the issue, but okay. um, there's a reason for that. Yeah, sure. But they have been helpful. Sure. I mean, I mean, generally speaking, you, you said when, when it was getting set up, kind of the thing was, hey, now investigators won't have to necessarily walk door to door all the time. It saves man, uh, manpower, hours of kind of are kind of trimmed down. Is that generally has that been the case that you found during oh, yeah. investigation? So what the benefit is is that historically an incident happens, a detective gets assigned the case, they're then reviewing the case, and they go out to that neighborhood and they spend hours going door to door knocking hoping that they can find someone that will answer the door just so they can make contact with someone to see whether or not that they can get access and look at their video surveillance and they do that over and over and over again because everyone in that neighborhood has different schedules and some will answer the door at certain times and so it's hours of work um, 
that's not going away, but what they're able to do is utilize Fusis in the Real Time Crime Center and get access to that area and those cameras quicker. And they can send out those messages and go, hey, do you have access to it? Can you check these out, you know, this time frame? And some of that information will come back much sooner. So at least we're getting some of the uh, video surveillance or some of the, the information and communication with residents or business owners much faster, which at least gives us things to follow up on quicker versus the out like hours or days um, to take that. Yeah, I think honestly I, on one case, uh, I won't say which case, but I know it was nine hours for one case just trying to track down uh, cameras along a, a, a suspected route. And, and these are the early days. I mean, that's why we look into launch the incentive program to get more businesses and, and residents uh, signed up. Uh, and then, oh, go ahead. Are there areas uh, in the city that the, that, that the city is and the police department are going to act that they say can, can we integrate, can get into integrated camera in a certain area? Um, obviously, you have areas where you know where uh, crimes in certain areas where there's uh, transit to and from, you know, high traffic areas, things like that. Uh, is the city or the, or the police department going to, going to look at approaching businesses since you're offering them incentive program? Yeah, then that's already happened. I mean, there, there, our pilot program identified uh, a number of businesses. A lot of them were gas stations where, where a lot of activity happens. And so we'll continue to look at, as this incentive program uh, rolls out, uh, it's going to be broad based across the entire city. But uh, of course, uh, we know there are some, some problem spots that we want to get business owners uh, on board. Is there any dollar signs that goes how much the, uh, you're going to put toward the incentive program at this point? Uh, don't have the budget number. I mean, we had, so the, if you recall, the American Rescue Plan dollars, we had a million and a half uh, set aside for technology upgrades. Some of that went to the FUSIS, uh, you know, getting that up and running. Some of it went to the crime center itself. Uh, I believe we still have a, a good, uh, good portion of that left to, to give incentives, but also uh, there are, we've heard from small businesses across the city that they're interested if we could help them out, they would be interested in, in connecting. So there are also some uh, other, some small business uh, dollars that uh, could come into play too. So how those, I, I don't, th I guess the, the point being is I, I don't think we're going to see a, a funding limitation. It's going to be who comes on board uh, is really the, the limitation. And it's not just, it's not just police reaching out or talking to specific businesses, gas stations. This is a combined city entity effort. I mean, we have IT, we have community outreach, we have actually VPA uh, and several others that actually will go out uh, either without us or with us or a combination of we have people not even involved with the city um, kind of helping us out, breaking the ice maybe in some cases. Um, and then just giving a different perspective than, than somebody showing up wearing a badge and a gun going, hey, we need, uh, yeah, sometimes that doesn't sit well with people and we totally get it. But the community has asked for this. Our council has asked for this. Obviously, the mayor has been pushing this for, for quite some time, and we're at a, it's not comfortable to me. We should have a lot more. Um, but we'll, we'll get there, and we're, we're making very good progress. And I wanted to ask, too, kind of a quick pivot to the Michigan Crime Stoppers update. I know that maybe about a month or two ago, we were here, I was here talking with you, specifically Lieutenant Miller, about the, you know, this new, this new campaign to bring awareness to some of these cases that you feel maybe you're a little bit closer to and that these mobile ads could help. So how has that gone throughout the first month of, you know, April was the first complete month specifically with uh, Alexis Morales, and now we're in, you know, halfway through the second month. How's it going? We did. So analytics came in, and there were about 40,000 um, uh, reviews, I think, is or views on Alexis's case. And so um, that any tips that would come in would get re referred right back to the lead investigators on that. I know that they're still actively working that case, um, and we'll continue to work that case until we can get answers. Uh, same thing will happen with Johnny Lee Johnson, which started May 1st. Um, and there'll be some more details coming out on that case probably here this week, just of, of another plea to the community. We know that there was people um, that were outside um, when this happened. It was a very sunny day. It was May 12th. Um, it was very sunny. It was warm. Um, there was a handful of people outside. He was shot and killed in front of his house, in front of his child. And there were people outside that did not say a word to police and have not come forward, and that's not okay. 
and this campaign is perfect because it gives them the opportunity. It's people from this community and it's people from that area that are traveling within that mile radius. And so that allows for them to just click that ad and submit an anonymous tip. So if they don't wanna to come to a detective, all they have to do is click on that ad and they can submit an anonymous tip. So I think I'm very hopeful that we can get some progress with uh, these unsolved cases um, and hopefully it's something that moving forward crime stoppers can continue the campaign and I know previously we spoke about how it's difficult it's hard to say you know you could get a ton of tips coming in at one time and maybe another time it could be super slow so it's hard to gauge how many tips are coming in but based on that one month alone and however many clicks that you had on that ad have you seen any of those kind of fruits from your labor already I think that's something we're still trying to keep uh, or still trying to evaluate so I don't have a, a good answer on that one just yet can you say how many tips that you received for just the month of April for Alexis Morales? I don't have that with me, no. Okay, sorry. got it, no problem. Um, moving to the shooting statistics that I'm looking at here, um, looks like 10, 10 fewer people shot mm -hmm. this year today from last year, and you mentioned it, 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 it pack is the fewest numbers in 2019 there. Um, obviously public safety and gun violence were a big part of the campaigning uh, in the recent primary elections. Um, and then I guess combining the, the fewer shooting victims, but then there were two more fatal shooting victims. And it, it looks like in, incidents overall are up a little bit. Um, I don't know if I don't, I'm using the term mixed bag. I don't know if there's a better term you have. But what are kind of your your takeaways from that for the first part of this year? Um, anything you find notable about that? Or no, I, I think maybe just a quick reiteration. I, I, yes, we did have 10 less victims and four more incidents that we had in the same comparison. So analytically, it is what it is. The feeling feels like a heck of a lot more, because I feel it, we all do. Um, on that note, we, we had, 17 non-fatal and seven fatal. Um, we had other shootings that were not criminal, whether self-inflicted intentional, self-inflicted accidental. Um, and again, just as a reminder, those are not counted on here because they don't involve uh, criminal activity whatsoever. But this could spin into so many different things. Is it, is it the permitless carry? Is it whatever? All these things absolutely play a factor. Uh, but I don't know how many people watched the uh, the panel we had last night, but look, no matter what any of these show, these numbers show, emotion is involved, period. Doesn't matter what the emotion was, usually anger, um, but 100% of these are emotion involved. A lot of these are social media, he said, she said, response, all of a sudden 150, 200 people on Snapchat get a notification, something bad's about to go down, they all show up there. We have 150 witnesses, none of them or very few of them come forward after something bad happens. Um, so just back in the day, well, at least when I was a kid, if there was gonna be a fight at school, Kayla and I is gonna fight at recess, they would whisper down the hallway and people at recess would be like, oh, whoever heard about it was there. Now it's instantaneous. It's 150, 200 people showing up or watching it on some type of, of social media live uh, where this is happening. And if we're finding out about it after the fact, certainly people knew during or actually prior to the fact and we're not getting contact. We can prevent these. We can, I guarantee you we can prevent these if we knew about them. And what do you feel like, too, just going into this summer, how do you feel, especially given the fact that we're going to have way more officers on the street, you know, compared to what was it the same amount of police officers as you had at a peak in July 19? How do you yeah. feel going into the summer? And there are there any other factors that you want residents to know about? Well, it's any day of the week, any time of day, all year round for us, I can tell you, sitting up here, um, many, many sleepless nights. Um, because you're worried about something or you are dealing with something. The, the text from even the mayor at 2.30 in the morning wanting to know what happened. Um, so emotional, physical, psychological toll affects us too on top of that. We do, we, we have tactics and measures in place. That doesn't mean it's going to stop or even, uh, you, you see what's happening and I, I can tell you anecdotally after 35 years when the weather gets warmer, um, bad things tend to happen. Pass cross, Opportunities are there, tempers are not forgotten, 
whether it was something on social media or something that somebody said, you know, the day before Christmas, and now they remember, and that opportunity is there. Those are taking, it's a whole variety of things. You cannot plan, predict um, those things from happening. So, uh, again, if, you, if we're able to predict human emotion and human nature before the fact, we definitely wouldn't be having this conversation. If somebody does, you know, I want in on that investment. And yeah, I mean, and there's a limit of what police can do. So what the police can do, you, you see the shot spotter connect missions. They're going to places that, that they think they'll be most effective. We can't have an officer on every corner, uh, every hour of every day of the year. We, even when you're fully staffed, there's a limited resources. So we're deploying them as best as possible. And so they're going to where we think they need to go, which is a good part of the job. And then, of course, the, the Detective Bureau is solving uh, homicides and, and getting violent offenders, doing their part to get violent offenders off the streets at rates well above the national average. So from a department standpoint, we feel great. Of course, you know, when we look at uh, violent crime and gun violence in general, uh, we've seen an uptick across the country over the last 10 years. Um, there, there's obviously bigger reasons for that, uh, whether it's partly, uh, you know, more readily accessibility of guns, uh, whether it's other social factors that are, that are going into it. But there's, a, there's been a, an uptick across the country over the last 10 years. Uh, there was a, a particular uptick over the course of the pandemic. And so, you know, we do feel good that, you know, last year, you know, things started, to, the number of incidents went down last year. Here, we're starting to see uh, the shooting victims go down. A little early to say that, that, that we'll, you know, we'd like to get through a, you know, a summer quarter to, to be able to say that things are actually going down this year. But at the very least, it seems like the increase that we saw over the pandemic has at least, that has stopped. But it was too high. I mean, our levels, when you look at the longer term, were higher. You know, zero is, you know, of course, where you want to be. But even in 2019, they were higher than, you know, the average, uh, you know, just 10 years prior when the community was still outraged for and rightfully so for, for gun violence. So still very high, still a top priority. And uh, we're, we're hopeful that with the, with the number of officers, with other things coming into play, that, uh, you know, we're starting to turn the tide here. But it doesn't help when the state does things like uh, permitless carry. Uh, doesn't take uh, common sense measures uh, for for uh, to limit guns getting into the wrong hands. I mean, you can have disputes. Some of these are just simple disputes uh, that you know, if they didn't have a gun right there, wouldn't end in in, in a shooting. And so, uh, <laughs> we're not going to be able to stop disputes. Uh, you know, that's that's beyond the reach of, of government or, or any. So there are always going to be disputes. Uh, you know, I wish we could do more on on uh, common sense uh, gun measures. Because uh, that would certainly help. I mean, you, you can see that uh, in different data. And there, there was a study that came out just last year that those uh, those states that, re that relax uh, restrictions uh, on carrying firearms have an increase uh, of incidents. And so it's all the evidence is all there. It, that, but unfortunately, that's not something we can control at the city. And, and we'll continue to push our state and federal lawmakers to take action because this is a huge problem in our community and communities across the country. Technical question to me when we're when the stat mentions a group member involved shootings is that determined by if there is a shooting and the suspect is believed to be a member of a group or does it have to be even more particular where it's a member of a group who carried out that shooting for reasons that are related to the group? Uh, am I making sense? Yeah. Okay. Again, it's just kind of a technical question of how that's right. Yeah, I can break that down. Yeah. So it doesn't just have to be a suspect. It could be the victim or someone else involved. So a witness, someone that is on scene when that incident takes place, if it's an individual that's in, been involved in group or gang violence in the past, then that incident is GMI. Okay, thanks. I appreciate it. So e even if, so if someone is a, a victim of a, of a shooting and they are a member of the group, even if the shooting was, from everything you can determine, was not involved with like a rival group or anything like that, it's still considered GMI? Yes, it is, because okay. we take measures with our SAVE team as well. So if someone is known to be GMI and they're a victim of the shooting, even if that was an isolated incident, there's maybe social services that we can utilize to help that individual. Okay. 
So that's why we, we classified as GMI. Is there any significance to the fact that the 58, 59% of uh, you know, 58% for year to date for this year versus the 19 to 23 is 59% being the same? I mean, is, there, is that significant or not significant? Uh, because there's always talk about groups and gang activities that um, go up and down. Um, I think I was told yesterday that uh, there's only one very, one currently very one organized active gang. Yeah, it was probably more than that. Well, I was told that the seven. Yeah. I was told that yeah I'm, I'm glad you, I'm glad you said that because. But I think we yeah, yeah. This, this number has been thrown out all over the place the last few years. Yeah. Um, every gang is a group, right. but not every group is a gang. Exactly. So three or more would would constitute if if uh, there's a whole statute um, that's when it comes to RICO and all these other things that are required um, to when we make arrest and and. It, and throw in a gang enhancement, not throw in, but like legitimately have a gang enhancement in there. Um, and if we were, I was looking, you said something about the 58% or whatever. Well, the, the percentage of the members in that stat says uh, year to date, uh, 58% GMI for year to date this year versus 2019 to 2023 was 59%. Yeah, and when you're looking at percentages, the number, the, the number is going up and down too. Right. And so the numbers, you know, you, I, we've seen a pretty consistent somewhere in this range, uh, you know, year to year. And, you know, you can, when you look at multiple years, it, that levels out the, you know, the noise and the statistics. But it's not a, I, I don't think, we still know that, you know, more, more of the shootings are, are done uh, GMI related. So here we're saying 59%. There's always an unknown factor too that, that we have in there. It's a little smaller this year than, than it was last year. And so some of those could also be uh, GMI related. So, you know, and that's a big part of our, our, uh, our, our intervention strategy is on these group related uh, shootings. And so uh, that's where, where a lot of that focus is. And then when you think of the other remaining, uh, uh, a lot of those are the, the one offs. And those, those, you know, the group, we at least have a strategy, we have a national best practice, and we're putting resources toward. When you start thinking of the other percentages, the one offs, that we can't be in every household, we can't be on every corner, and that's where those will be tough. Those are access to guns. Those are are, are all the other pieces that uh, those are harder to, to get a handle on, other than you know the bigger social issues and the bigger trends that are, even go beyond the city. But that's why we focus on what we can control or what we can we we think we can make a big difference on is we focus on these because that's where we think we can we can bring the number down. This might be a question um, that we've probably talked about before, but just looking at the, you know, the gun violence breakdown of, you know, even from 2019, it looks like we're more similar to those levels from 2019. Obviously, 2020 happened, shot up, and then kind of it's been, you know, coming its way back down in terms of the, the gun violence breakdown. What are some factors you think that have gone into, you know, bringing those gun violence levels down over the last couple of years? I mean, again, I, I think we we follow a lot of trends uh, and you can see this nationally uh, during the pandemic there was a there was an increase uh, across the country and as kind of the the stable as kind of that chaotic time uh, and time when when uh, a lot of people were isolated uh, they didn't have access to different things um, as we've been able to do more and, and in a lot of places uh, you know some of the intervention strategies had to take because of the pandemic we weren't able to do call-ins for example or or other types of, of interventions and so as those have returned as, as uh, things have gotten back to normal we're starting to get back to roughly where we were before the pandemic but we know that's still higher than we were 10 plus years ago um, still lower, I think, than the, I believe than the than the 1990s. But you know, some of these things go in in waves, and you know, a lot of people study this, and you know, there's no satisfactory answer for why 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 is it why does it go why does it ebb and flow uh, like it does. Thank you. Yeah. So for clarification, you said uh, you guys are installing the flock L uh, LPR cameras uh, in or near parking garages. Correct. And when does that begin? It's already begun. Okay, already begun. Mm -hmm. They're not being utilized in the real-time crime center yet because the installation is still taking place. Sure. Do you have a date on um, the completion of that? Or they believe by the end of May. Believe by the end of May, okay. Any other questions? Um, so 
we're seeing kind of these comparisons from last year um, around this time to this year. Has there been any, I mean, I'm sure because it's warmer this quarter, but from last quarter to this quarter, have we seen any kind of significant trends? Regarding like shootings or the? Just in general. Yeah, shootings. I mean, again, it's all anecdotal, at least from my perspective. So say, is the warmer weather? Is it less rain? Uh, is it moon phases? Like, those legitimately could be a factor in things. I, I can only tell you anecdotally. So even though we do have less victims, when you have an 11-year-old involved in a, in a homicide, that feels like 111 other people. To me, it does anyway. So... There's, there's two components here. We know factually crimes have been committed, but you can never know factually what the fear of those crimes are after they've happened or before a crime happens. That's one of the things we've been contending with, not just here in South Bend, but nationally. Think tanks, you name it. Matter of fact, I'm the, the end of uh, next month, I'll be going to D.C. with the ATF um, for uh, closed sessions uh, at the Capitol. Uh, to discuss some things like this from different ideas uh, throughout the country um, and try to get a beat on this. I, I don't know what other, I don't know if we can, how we can, but hopefully somewhere, somehow, we can, as, as a collaborative team nationally, come up with some ideas that they may come from us or from somewhere else. Um, but the feeling is something that I don't, I don't know how you even contend with that. In terms of the the gun violence, and I know that a lot of this is on the you know the the real time, you know the the public safety on your website. But I, I was just curious, have you seen? There's always been kind of a rumor of gun violence victims are getting younger and younger. Can we see that happening in the city right now in terms of victims, whether they're homicides or? It, it would, no, we actually just did look into, it and it's still the, the the same age range, 18 to 25. I think naturally, I think they bumped it to 26, 18 to 26. But we're still with right around the 18 to 25 mark so maybe like Tian horston and some of those younger victims are outliers in that that bunch yeah um but we see younger people having guns yes i mean that is uh, it, it it's a problem i mean we, we we i mean we know uh in our schools you've you've reported on many incidents those are very alarming to us that younger and younger kids are showing up with guns and it's only if you have a gun kids fight, it's only a matter of time that some one of these uh, ha has a, a tragic ending. So um, I, I think the fact that we've seen guns in the hand, more and more in the hands of younger kids is not a good trend for us. But fortunately, to date, uh, you know, in terms of the numbers, the, these incidents have been more outliers. So kind of a both, kind of a both, uh, kind of a both answer is, yeah, they're, they're outliers right now, but um, but there are younger children getting access to guns. Is that safe to say more more children getting access to guns? Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. Okay. Is there any update on Tian Horston in this case? Um, Not yet. No. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. I, I'll remain confident, as I stated from the get go. You guys will be the first to know. Yes. Second to know. <laughs> Second to know. That's okay. <laughs>